Hello, my name is Robert Clark. I run an architectural design studio called RALX, based in Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Growing up in Brooklyn, <laughs> it was a very interesting experience because you had a contrast between the classes. Well, there's three main classes. You had, you know, your lower class, middle class, and high, rich, wealthy class. And so I kind of grew up in a higher middle class, middle class um, neighborhood. Uh, but I spent most of my time in East New York with my grandparents, which was on the fringe between um, low income and middle income houses. And that was interesting because growing up in Brooklyn in the 90s and early 2000s, Brooklyn was very Brooklyn, where you still saw sneakers hanging on the phone lines, uh, the original grit was still there. You had block parties. Um, there was a very strong sense of community. Anytime you go anywhere and you were from Brooklyn, you wouldn't say you're from New York, you know, you would say you're from Brooklyn. So there was a very strong sense of identity. And probably in the beginning of 2006, uh, that's when I started to go to high school. I went to high school in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And from my perspective, that's when gentrification really started to evolve. Um, and the heart of gentrification kind of had its playground in Williamsburg because Williamsburg is one train stop away from Manhattan. So a lot of people that lived in Manhattan but didn't want to pay Manhattan prices came to live in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And all of those people that were native to Williamsburg uh, got displaced because a lot of the cheap housing got replaced with expensive condominiums. So if you go to Williamsburg now, there's um, an Apple store, there's a Whole Foods. Those are the two main stores you know. Once they come in, the whole neighborhood is going to change. If you see it, if you, so Whole Foods comes first. And so once Whole Foods comes, then the transformation is complete and capped off when the Apple store comes. So once you go to Williamsburg now, it's completely different. You have really nice nail salons, salons, brunch spots, uh, like I said, the Apple store. And so I, when if you came to Brooklyn in 2006 versus 2020, is a complete contrast. When I was growing up, you know, McCarran Park was closed. Uh, so all we had basically was the handball courts and basketball courts. But now if you go, right, McCarran Park is open and McCarran Park is this is the biggest pool in Brooklyn and it, it stretches like a block. And when I went to high school, it was, you know, people didn't go there or only skaters went there and it was kind of like this haunted place and now it's super beautiful. So you, you could kind of see the, how state legislation kind of takes takes care of the higher economic standing people. And when that land uh, was mostly for uh, middle income or lower income people. The, the pool was closed down, the neighborhood wasn't taken care of. Um, and all of these are city recreational um, systems that's legislated by the city. And they were just kind of abandoned. And as soon as gentrification happened, that's when the city started to clean up all the parks and all the recreational areas. So you kind of could see the systemic racism um, that's a part of gentrification. So that thought of work kind of influences me because I'm trying to provide a great design aesthetic for everyone that's affordable for everyone. So if you look at my work, it's really kind of influenced by Renaissance architecture, um, Arabic Renaissance architecture, biology, um, and those things don't have to do with affordability, but in terms of how they're created, uh, mass manufacturing, uh, local materials. So the tectonic nature of my systems that I use to employ my aesthetics has to do with the affordability part of that. So that's how growing up in Brooklyn and growing up in a black community affected my aesthetic. It, it doesn't affect it particularly in the visual concept of it, but in the constructability and how it's constructed in terms of local materials, local people, um, so basically everything tectonic is, is, is local based. Um, and that's how that influenced me. And it also influenced me because when I was growing up, there was a div like a huge diversity in culture. 
Um, and everybody had their own culture they hung on to as a sense of identity, but there was also an intermingling, like when you went to, say, high school or you went to other social gatherings. And so when I left New York and I went to architectural school in Rhode Island, there was a huge contrast because I did not go to a Rhode Island School of Design, which is in Providence. I went to Roger Williams. And Roger Williams is more of a rural and suburban campus versus the urban kind of setting I grew up in. So that also allowed me to identify with people that didn't grow up in urban settings. And after graduating, I went to work in Texas, and then after that, Shanghai, and now I'm in LA. And becoming a type of architectural nomad allowed me to gather different perspectives and also different architectural techniques and methodologies and now kind of converge that in the, in the mixing pot of my processes and architectural way of thinking to now create an architectural architecture that kind of addresses all these different perspectives. Um, so that's kind of how I was influenced by Brooklyn, how I was influenced by traveling around to different areas. And I think my life can be a kind of roadmap to future black architects in terms of I didn't go to say a Ivy League school and usually in architecture is a very elitist society if you don't go to you know the Harvards the MITs the Columbias you don't get in get the really prestigious internships you don't get the really prestigious first jobs and what I noticed is the prestigious jobs in the main cities like New York and Los Angeles are really hard because you have like those inf influx of really prestigious schools. But the reason I traveled around is because I could work in prestigious studios that were outside of the main metropolitan areas. So, you know, I first worked in Austin, Texas for um, a pretty big architectural studio. And then I worked in Shanghai and then I worked in LA. And then gay garnering all those experiences I built in my resume with great studios, but that's because I was allowed to travel. So I would say also for black architects, I would definitely say you should travel around. But the main challenge with architectural education is the affordability. Um, luckily, I had parents that helped me and guided me through kind of getting through that process. But I knew a lot of my peers that I went to high school with didn't have that type of guidance. So I think, number one, there needs to be more mentorship in the black um, architectural community. Um, not only by black architects, but by all architects. And then the next thing I think is a major challenge is the affordability of architectural education. So I think there needs to be more black grants, uh, more schools need to be offering full scholarships to black students. And then once we get an abundance of black architects, then the, the profession could be, you know, influxed with all this new culture, identity, and voices um, of the black architect. And then hopefully we will get actual, you know, there's been no black uh, uh, Prisca Prize winners. So hopefully that happens soon. Um, there's, and there are major black voices in, you know, the architectural profession, such as David Ajahe, Francis Carey, um, but those are African. Um, there are no black American major uh, design voices in the architectural community. In the design community, you have Kanye, you have Virgil, but in architecture, uh, the black African-American voice is kind of silent. So that's a major change that has to happen. So hopefully through this exhibition and through hopefully the work of my fellow artists and me, these voices can start to be heard and there could be an influence, influence of different ideas and different methodologies um, seen through this exhibition and just attention paid to this kind of epidemic of a lack of black voices.